Welcome to this first case study for best practices for validating chemical probes. Here we will look at MALT1 protease inhibitors and see how some of the guidelines we presented in the webinar were used to validate chemical probes for MALT1 protease. Let's start with the target, MALT1. MALT1 is a key node in the NFKVB pathway. This is a very important pathway that is essential to many immune functions. For this reason, it has been a target in the pharmaceutical industry for many, many years, but it was found that it's very difficult to target the NF-kappa B pathway. The main reason is that if you fully block NF-kappa B, this leads to very strong toxicities and very strong immunosuppression, which of course is not very attractive for a critic. Now, the reason MALT1 became interesting is that it had actually two different functions. The first one is a scaffold-dependent function, which directly regulates the nf b pathway. As shown here in gray, if you stimulate, for example, the T-cell of the B-cell receptor, MALT1 will form, together with two other proteins, a complex that will then act as a scaffold to recruit downstream proteins, such as TRAS6, ultimately leading to a translocation of nf b into the nucleus. This, in turn, will trigger a variety of T and B-cell responses. Now, it's not desired, of course, to block MALT1 scaffolding function, as mentioned before. This would completely block nf -kappa b and lead to toxicities. However, MALT1 has a second function, which is that of a protease, which cleaves several negative regulators of nf -kappa b So one hypothesis was compounds that would selectively inhibit the protease function of MALT1 could reduce nf b activation, but without full pathway blockade, and could represent an attractive therapeutic strategy, for example, in autoimmune diseases. Now, in order to study this, it was required to have suitable chemical probes to study the biology and the function of MALT1 protein. So in order to do this, the group needed a starting point. And early on, there was already one compound reported as a MALT1 protease inhibitor. The compound is shown here. It was designed as a classical cysteine protease inhibitor, MALT1 being a cysteine protease. And you do this by taking, in this case, four amino acids of one of the substrates of MALT1 and adding to it this fluoromethyl ketone, which is a covalent reactive moiety that will react with the catalytic cysteine, cysteine 464 of MALT1, and inactivate the enzyme. This is a very potent inhibitor, 3 nanomolar IC15, a biochemical assay. However, it's not an ideal probe. First, it has very limited activity in cells, greater than 10 micromolar, presumably because it's peptidic and very polar. But also importantly, it's not selective. It actually hits many other proteases, such as thrombine and many others. So this was neither a good chemical probe nor a good starting point to optimize a chemical probe. So the group ran a high throughput screen using a functional enzymatic assay on MALT1 to find additional starting points. And they found this urea here, which had an IC50 of 500 nanomolar. This was then optimized into this inhibitor, MLT748, which has now a biochemical potency of 5 nanomolar. Now, what was interesting about this compound is that it doesn't contain any obvious reactive moiety, which is not unusual, but still quite rare for cysteine protease inhibitor. So the question was, how do these compounds actually inhibit MALT1, and are they true inhibitors? And so the team went on and developed a set of validation experiments to understand the mode of action and validate this compound as a good chemical probe. The first set of experiments used the photoaffinity labeling technique. In this case, the team needed to make additional inhibitors containing these photoreactive labels. Then when you incubate MALT1 with one of these labeled compounds and you shine UV light on it, it will activate the label which will then lead to the formation of the covalent adduct with the protein. This covalent adduct will likely be made around the binding site of the compound, 
and you can then do proteolysis and MS analysis to find out where on the enzyme the compound was binding. This was the labeled area, and you can see that it's actually quite remote from the catalytic site and from the catalytic cysteine, where the other type of inhibitor was binding. The team went on to additional biophysical validation. First, they looked back NMR, and they made a C13 protein where all the methionines of MALT1 were labeled with C13. This allowed them to specifically monitor the signals associated with these methionines. And what they saw is a very strong modification of the signal of methionine 717 here in red when the compound was added, indicating that this methionine 717 is around the binding site of this compound. And this was consistent with the labeled area from the photoaffinity experiment. They went on to do surface placement resonance experiments, SPR. And here again, they see very convincing results with a concentration-dependent sensogram with an association phase and a dissociation phase from which they could derive affinity as well as kinetic parameter of the binding of this compound to MALT1. Finally, they could confirm the binding site by X-ray crystallography that generated a co-crystal structure of MLT748 in complex with MALT1. And this confirmed the other results they had obtained so far, which is that these compound binds in an allosteric site in between two domains of the protein, quite remote from the active site. You can look at a close-up of this allosteric pocket on the right, and you can see that the pocket is a hydrophobic pocket where the compound is nicely binding to. So all these experiments going from photoaffinity labeling, NMR, SPR, and finally X-ray crystallography is a very strong tag and engagement package at the biochemical level. So with this package, they could move on to studying the effects of this compound in cells. And what you have on the left is a pathway inhibition readout. When you stimulate cells, T cells, they will release IL-2. And the compound dose dependently inhibits IL-2 secretion with an acidity of 25 nanomoles. As mentioned in the webinar, we need to complement this pathway inhibition readout with something closer to our target engagement. In this case, <clears throat> they did this, as shown on the right, by directly monitoring substrate cleavage, MALT1 substrate cleavage. This is shown in the blue box. They could look at several substrates of MALT1 in cells. When you stimulate cells with PMA ionomycin, this leads to stimulation of MALT1, and you can immediately, after five minutes and over time, monitor cleavage products of OIL-1, RELB, SILD, as well as disappearance of the MALT1 substrate BCL10. This is shown in the column on the left. In the middle column is the same experiment using MLT748 as pretreatment of the cells. And you can see in this case the disappearance of the cleavage product of the MALT1 substrate and HOIL1, cleaved RLB, cleaved SILD, as well as the stabilization of BCL10 indicating inhibition of its cleavage. So this set of data is a very strong validation that the enzymatic activity of MALT1 is inhibited in cells and consists in a very good target engagement readout. As mentioned in the introduction, what the team wanted is compounds that blocked MALT1 protease activity but had limited effect on its scaffolding function. In order to do this, they did additional experiments looking at the NF-kappa-B direct signaling, which represents MALT1 scaffolding function. This is shown in the red box. So if you start to look at the left column, you see when, that when you stimulate the cells in the absence of compound treatment, you see appearance after five minutes of phospho I kappa B alpha and disappearance of I kappa B alpha. In the middle column, you see the same experiment with the MALT1 inhibitor MLT748, and you see very little differences, both for 
appearance of phospho kappa b alpha and disappearance of i kappa b alpha in the absence and the presence of MLT748, indicating that the compound has very limited effect on the scaffolding function. As a control, the team used the well-known IKK inhibitor, which is a nf kappa b pathway blocker. This is the experiment set on the right. And you can see that in this case, we have limited production of phospho I kappa b alpha and a stable I kappa b alpha. So this set of package was validating the usefulness of MLT748 in cells. So now we've covered the potency of these compounds. Let's go to their selectivity. First, we look at the target family. And here, the compound was tested against a set of proteases, including cysteine proteases, serine proteases, metalloproteases, and aspartic proteases. In all cases, there was no inhibition up to 100 micromolar, which represent more than 10,000 fold selectivity for this compound. In addition, it was tested in a standard set of 40 off-target, covering GPCRs, kinases, transporters, and ion channels. Again, very high selectivity was observed. So we know that it's a highly selective compound. It's potent. So far, so good. And finally, the team published a set of characterization of the chemistry properties of the compound, such as high permeability in two different assays, PAMPA and KECO2 reasonable solubility, looking at two different readouts, as well as reasonable lipophilicity profile. Again, indicating that this is a suitable chemical probe. The team made characterization data like NMR and high resolution MS data available, as well as synthetic procedures so that other teams can synthesize these compounds and use it. And finally, they made recommendations that this compound is appropriate for in vitro studies but not for in vivo studies. So this brings us to the end of this case study. And I hope what you see is that the validation of this particular chemical probe did not actually cover all of the guidelines that we presented during the webinar. However, they accumulated enough evidence through a few of these guidelines that the whole package is sufficiently robust to say this looks like a useful chemical probe for in vitro to study the biology of multiple proteins. And that's a reasonable way to validate the chemical probe. Thank you very much.